Hi, everyone. My name is Kimberly Roa Tejera. I am your host for today and Centro Special Projects Coordinator. We're so excited to have you here as we discuss Velorio, Javier Navarro's new novel on a, following a group of survivors searching for hope on an island torn apart by both natural disaster and human violence. Velorio, meaning wake, is a story of strength, resilience, and hope, a tale of peril and possibility buoyed by the deeply held belief in a people's ability to unite against those corrupted by power. Here with us today is author Javier Navarro Aquino, who was born in Puerto Rico and has worked, <clears throat> excuse me, awarded scholarships from the Bread Loaf Writers Conference, a Tennessee Williams scholarship from the C1E Writers Conference, a McDowell Fellowship and more. Also joining us is Maricel Moreno, who is the Rev. John A. O'Brien Associate Professor in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures at the University of Notre Dame, where she teaches USA Latino, uh, I'm sorry, Latinx literature, women authors on the island and the mainland. Also with us today is Maritza Stanich, a professor of English at University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, where she teaches Puerto Rican diaspora, Latinx, Caribbean, and American literatures at the BA, MA, and doctoral level. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our lovely panelists. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Well, Mutual admiration society. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to Mas, be here. For sure. Yes, it is. Yes. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. So um, I guess um, we, we were um, asked to, you know, just engage in a conversation. Just um, I'm saying this, you know, to our audience so that they know what to expect. Um, any reading uh, of segments from the book um, should happen, I guess, uh, in the context, you know, of a particular discussion. So we'll, we'll try to limit it to that. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, Xavier, do you want to start with some words uh, before we jump in, Maritza and I, and start asking you some questions? Yeah, uh, first, thank you, uh, Maritza, and thank you, Marisa, for, for agreeing to join me in this conversation. But more, uh, most importantly, thank you, Centro, for, for hosting us. It's a, it's a, a big event, uh, for me at least, uh, when it comes to looking at my calendar and thinking about what to look forward to. <laughs> and this was something that, that for a few months now, I've been I've been very excited about. A little nervous, of course, but but that's always good, right? To have a little bit of nerves um, in anticipation for this event. But um, for the most part, it's 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 a great uh, it's great excitement to be in in conversation with both of you, and more importantly, to be talking about such an important um, event that occurred in the history of of our island. Um, and in many ways, I think that the the novel. Um, tries to address uh, these complications, right? Tries to address the complications that came with with observation, that came with 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 realizing um, certain certain things <laughs> that 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 the storm um, highlighted for for everyone, right? For everyone, both um, on the island and in the diaspora. So, um, yes, I'm I'm excited to be to be in conversation with 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 both of you. Bueno. I, uh, I mean, I, I think I can start a little, I mean, a little bit by congratulating you. Um, I, uh, we're obviously very proud at UPR since you're an alumnus of our MA program. And some of us are honored to say that we saw some of your writing uh, in the very beginning. Um, and I have to say, ha having you know, been pretty up on contemporary uh, literature uh, uh, from the diaspora and even about Maria, the the lyricism, the the lyricism, and the profound sense of tragedy, um, the refusal to kind of nostalgize and I don't think he, the word hibaro is mentioned. We were talking about the Spanish translation. Um, which might be also interesting to talk about. So I really think um, this is kind of charting terrain it, at, 
maybe the maybe terrain that the storm itself you know wrought and um i i i mean i just want to congratulate you not just on the beauty of the novel but also for for and you know its artistry not just in terms of the writing but in terms of the the theme you know in term of in terms of the thematics um um I don't, there's so many places to start with, um, but Uda, Uda is, is probably the biggest question mark that I was left with the entire novel all the way through. And for me, it, it became a metaphor for so many things. Um, and so I think it's so important, maybe I'll just say this, that the novel more than the literal tragedy is a lyrical, almost abstract, um experience of the tragedy um i, I don't i don't I, i'd like to hear a little bit about where you were even like kind of the nuts and bolts of like where you were for maria um and then the observations of things like and i'll just mention two things then the beginning the electric the electric utility offices on ponce de leon avenue which look like brickle avenue in miami and the crowley refrigeration truck spoiler alert you know toward at the end of the novel so this deep insight um an astute observation of the late capitalist moment that coincides with maria which is really why maria was part of the reason why maria maybe a big part maybe a central part of why it was such a calamity which is another word i wanted to ask you about i, I use the word catastrophe and you and the novel repeatedly uses the word calamity mm -hmm. um so i just it's a more of a statement but um to me to me to me it it, it, it does break new ground um in ref, in refusing to romanticize yeah uh, the love I, is very obvious love is very obvious right the love is the love is pervasive but that refusal to romanticize i think is so important yeah i mean i could <clears throat> sorry i could i could speak a little bit on that i i think that one of the things that i that were, that i was most interested in when i decided to embark on on writing the novel was that i didn't want it to to carry kind of the 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 expectations of of what i what I perceive to be pretty conventional narratives of of, of Puerto Rico, or even just about um, how how the address of Puerto Rico is is manifested in contemporary fiction. Uh, so to me, it was it was this very interesting moment that, and I've said this I think in in different capacities and in different interviews that um, I was actually working on a different book. <laughs> so it. Um, this this narrative sort of fell out of me in a residency uh in i believe it was 2019 um in the fall of 2019 mm -hmm. when i was in a residency at, at in new hampshire um and i was there for two months um and i i found myself knowing that if, if i wouldn't write this novel at that in that position in that in that space that i wasn't probably going to write about the the hurricane um for varying reasons right um i i won't i won't exhaust those reasons but uh i after the storm immediately after the storm i wanted to return home um and i was able to get a flight probably four to five days um no less than a week after the storm hit which was an impossibility right there were a lot of people mm. trying to return um without any idea of what they would expect right like like most people um Mm -hmm. I was I was studying I was doing my PhD in of all places in Nebraska, um, which is which is mm -hmm. funny uh, that the Midwest I've spent so much time and now I'm here seemingly permanently <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> but um, I I had called my my mother and my brother uh, as the the day before the storm and I was looking at prices for tickets um, and they had obviously had dropped and and I wanted to be there to write up the storm with them because I just felt something really really intense was going to develop uh, just by the very nature of its transformation when it hit the lesser Antilles and then it it basically ballooned into this into this 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 calamity or catastrophe that was was coming and it it it, it, it when when I called them they basically said the obvious truth truth which was uh, we you shouldn't come because uh, we didn't plan for that that sort of 
those rations or that that reality. So I think that you should stay put. Um, so I didn't immediately come, and I spent a lot of time that day that the, that the storm made landfall in Yabuco and Umagao, um, just tracking the storm, um, mm. and 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 tracking the flight that that early morning that was that had actually arrived. So in some ways, I had seen myself landing there and not and not sharing that experience with with my my mom and my brother. Um, but immediately after the storm, I, I didn't hear from anyone, so no one did. Um, but I felt it a sense of responsibility to want to just feel like to go back. Um, and I brought cash with me because I, I anticipated the obvious, which was that it became a very, it was like the currency of, of transaction was cash. There was no electricity to, to sort of buy things in that way. Um, and so eventually, you know, long story short, I, I was able to, to, to return and, and see my mother and had a car rented out, but not sure if that was going to be a possibility either. Uh, so I was said that I was going to walk from 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 the airport to to Vega Baja, which is like 30, 30 to forty five minutes drive, but uh, a walk would be what <laughs> like half a day maybe or more. <laughs> it, it was a silly idea and it was a stupid idea, but for the most part I made it. Um, and my and my brother said this interesting line with me that always stayed with me, which was um, you should have turned that hero music off your head, right? And so you know you know brothers and siblings how they do their <laughs> their stuff, um, but. But it, it was it was impactful to see everything, right? It wasn't it wasn't a, a strange future, right? If you see the reflections of of of, of descriptions and and of realities or or how it it's been cataloged the novel as like a dystopia, it's like eh, it was it wasn't a dystopia, not to those who who experienced it immediately after. Um, everything, all those fears that manifested. Um, the fear either of crime or not being able to to gather resources, whether it's food or gasoline. Um, these things were 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 not dystopic. They were they were a reality. So it wasn't a far fetched thing mm -hmm. to imagine a, a a future in that way. So I, I embarked on writing it in 2019 in the fall of 2019, and um, I wrote it in, in 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 what six weeks or so or what however many because wow. that's, yeah that's wow. that's all you can that's all you can do at a residency right. <laughs> what else are you gonna do? You're in the woods. Um, so, so it was, it was a very, um, visceral experience writing it, but also, um, the inception of it came from, from that anecdote of that story of the sisters that, that were encased in, in, in a mudslide in Oduwalo and that, that, those characters never stayed, I mean, stayed with me for such a long time, right? So I, I, I thought of, of those sisters and I thought of Camila as, as the central character or the heart of the novel, of the novel, and it, and it, it, when she finally kept visiting me um, and insisting that I would write it, there was no other option but to do it uh, when you're left in isolation in the mountains. So that's that's sort of the, mm. the beginnings of, of, of the work itself. Mm. Mm. I also wanna um, congratulate you on this amazing um, work of fiction really grounded on on a reality that it's almost, um, it's really hard to put into words, honestly, uh, what happened. And of course there's this whole other side of it, which is how those of us who were um, stateside experienced <laughs> uh, uh, the lack of communication, the not knowing the whereabouts of our family, you know, it was a completely different experience for those of us who, who are on, on this side, right? Um, equal, you know, powerful uh, for sure, right? Um, but it allows us to, to also, you know, uh, understand even better um, what people on the, in the archipelago, you know, went through, right? So I wanted to, um, of course, I have a lot of questions, um, things I'd love to talk about, and we're not going to have time to get to all of it. But I'm thinking, you know, I'm picking up on Urayuan. Uh, Maritza mentioned Urayuan to me. He's such a fascinating character. I mean, he begins with this it, very um, um, just kind of positive and uh, vision, right, of, of a future. I mean, the, the whole idea of breaking with the old government, so so connected to the idea of, you know, anti-colonialism and, and he's promising this almost like utopia, right, to the people who end up following him. 
and then he seems to take a turn you know like he his character like from from the origin of his vision to what ends up you know actually materializing it, it it's such a it's so drastic it seems i mean there's so much violence there I'm just, so this is a question about Urayuan, but also just in general about the novel and the commentary that it's making on, on the legacy of, of on colonialism in Puerto Rico, right? Um, how, how do you feel the novel like uh, moves forward that conversation about colonialism uh, in Puerto Rico? Yeah, Ur Urayuan is, is, I'd like to thank um, uh, one of them, one of the most interesting characters in the novel because he's very divisive or not even divisive, right? I think just people flat out don't like him, which is fine. <laughs> he's, not, um, he's not a likable character in that capacity, but he's a, he's a nuanced character. I think that one of the things that he carries uh, throughout the book is this responsibility of language and this burden of language. And so he, he essentially um, thinks of, of uh, so he expresses himself in a very stream of conscious way, right? He he rants. He's, he's he's predisposed to ranting continuously about many things, about history, about um, about his own personal history. So he alludes to some of these personal tragedies that he's experienced, but he doesn't really develop them in, in any sort of way. Um, he's, I think, a very um, he's a very colonial subject. Uh, I, when I thought of writing him or I thought about him as a character, I wanted a character in, to, think, to think about language in the way that, that Caliban uses language in The Tempest, right? That, that Caliban kind of um, expresses himself through nature, expresses himself in, in, in a very, as Walcott had said before, that, that Caliban carries this beautiful language in The Tempest that is sort of forgotten. And I think that in post-colonial studies, we have we have adopted him as kind of this interesting figure of of of, com, of complication and of, of of duality, right? These 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 dispositions, and I think there isn't a greater um, um, character to model after another character than, than a Caliban figure. So he carries these histories. He carries the the histories of of, of two empires, and he says this in, in his first introduction. I think um, every the way I imagined every character being introduced were in these sense, these, these sort of semblances of declarations um, in different ways. So when every character is introduced or introduces themselves in the novel, they, they kind of um, are, are trying to make a statement about something that is important potentially to them or maybe to something larger. And, and the way Urayuan is introduced, he comes in a little bit later on, right? In some ways, the way Caliban comes in a little bit later on in the play where he He's kind of immersed in these these possibilities of observations of like the drill rig that's off Seva. He's 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 thinking about um, modernity. He's thinking about uh, capitalism, and he's just finding it to be a, a an inheritance of 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 colonial structures that are not working. But he's a hypocritical character, right? <laughs> because he's not he's not aware that 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 he's he himself is is the very thing that he that he tries to critique and so it's very obvious in how he's uh he's um he's referring to bayfish as hag seated right so that's like a, a signaling of 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 the caliban figure um when he himself carries that as well and so i i wanted a character that wasn't going to be um an easy villain though i think people have cataloged him as an easy villain and he is as far as his action but not as far as potentially his ambition or not as far as in his regret. Um, there's, a, there's a scene where he commits an, a, a violent act later on and he almost, he forgives himself and he cries. And it's, a, it's one, of the most, one of the more intimate moments that he carries in the novel where he, he, yeah. he sort of isolates himself after committing the act with, with his, I guess, his minions. And he, he washes himself in the river, almost as sort of a, baptism, a, baptism, a baptism of, of all these of all these histories, and so I wanted, I I wanted this novel and these characters, especially what I want to carry a complication that is inherent in the conversation that is Puerto Rico, that is contemporary Puerto Rico, that it isn't something that we can sort of assume to be. Okay, well, this novel is trying to preach for an independence, or this novel is trying to preach for a statehood, or this novel is trying to preach for this and that, rather that the novel is trying to open up. Um, multitudes and possibilities that that we we have to consider 
Uh, but more importantly, and I think the most important thing that that occurs, especially with Camila and her action that she commits late late at the very end of the novel, is that we we have to be mindful as Puerto Ricans not to carry um, sort of the colonial scars that we inherit. Um, and I think that's that's part of the conversation that they're that they're all trying to have with each other in different ways. Some act it out in 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 more productive ways, like Chael, right? I think he's He's a beautiful character. Um, uh, Moribibi and Damaris themselves are, are also very, are very um, particular as far as their, their intentions and what they want and their hopes and dreams. Um, so they're all different, different possibilities, I think. Uh, and I think it's a, comp it's a complicated novel and I hope that that would be the case as, as Maritza kind of asked early on, like how, how to write about a novel um, that captures this in a very potentially different way. I was like, well, I, I will, I will explore multiple voices, which is already a, a, a faux pas that in publishing, it's like, okay, <laughs> that's going to be a problem. But let's 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 increase that. Let's talk about poetry. Let's actually have um, my failed desires as a poet implemented in on the page and and bringing in poeticisms and and different and different things. So um, I think it was rewarding to think about it in that way, and it was exhausting, um, but. But overall, I hope that it 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 will continue to pave different possibilities for writers that will address this this topic in different varied ways. Mm. Yeah, Marita. Cheo. Oh yeah, Cheo. Cheo. Cheo's nickname was like Tito, so. For me, Cheo, there was a kind of every man. And Cheo also was the, I think, only markedly older character. I thought it was very important that most of the characters were young. Yeah. I thought it was important because generationally, one or two generations of Puerto Ricans are being expulsed from the island, certainly um, in particular sectors um, and maybe across sectors. And of course, not completely, but in, in, in historic uh, numbers. And, uh, and so I thought it was interesting, generationally speaking, that it was mostly youth. And Shale, the, the writing, the way in which um, it invokes writing as a craft um, and also the, the being adrift, uh, the being adrift on the, um, being adrift reminded me of the old man in the sea. I, it, so it also struck me as a Caribbean, in a in a broad in a in a broad way, um, I know I'm invoking Hemingway, <laughs> but um, so I think Cheo was really important. Um, also, um, uh, I mean, it it struck me that way. Um, um, the lyricism is just so amazing in so many of the characters, um, mm -hmm. and then the multiple characters. I mean, I also I mean, I think a lot of I'm surprised to hear that publishers might not like that, being that you know right. such important works do that um, yeah. and have done that. Um, mm -hmm. So I, um, I I thought I thought I thought there I thought it was important that there were a lot of that most of the characters were young. I don't know if that's a, a, genera a generational uh, gesture. Maybe I mean you obviously are a new generation of writers, so. It, it, is that a purposeful, is that purposeful? Um, and, um, and then the way in which writing is invoked, um, you know, uh, the, the actual compulsion from, from the perspective, yes. right, the compulsion to write. Yes, I, I, I think it's most- and the um, Yeah, I mean, it's most Sorry. apparent with Moribibi, right? Um, that she essentially is ascribing to no political allegiances and, and mm -hmm. it's, it's a part of, of, of a larger and hopeful optimistic wave of, of potential for change of something that is removing itself from the, the traditional standards that were that have been in place for, for, for a very long time. Um, mm. And so I, I, I wanted these characters and, and, and would you want kind of gestures at that too, right? He's like, I don't want, um, I don't want sort of old histories to, to, to saturate and ruin my vision, even though he's not exactly uh, a spring chicken either. I mean, I guess in context potentially, but he's not, he's not a teen. I think I, I always imagine like as an early 20, 
20 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so he has these very archaic and stupid rules about what he imagines to be a better society that carries these, these things. But um, he, he sort of, it's, it's still inscribed in a very, very traditional um, authoritative, uh, authoritative mm -hmm. um, construct. And I, I think the, the things that, that I most admired about Chio and, I, and, I, and how he implements language and he, he, he makes these gestures um, throughout the novel is that he feels um, inadequate to to be the one of the record keepers of, of this event and and in some ways he carries mm -hmm. this notebook that in turn uh, reappears in a very subtle way at the end as sort of like passing on writing as as a form of, of, of witness um, mm -hmm. but that that I always imagined him as as Shabin or imagined him as as like in, in the schooner flight um, a, a character that is most um, in love with with the power of, of the word or the power of poetry, um, and that that is mm -hmm. that is the potential for for a legacy to be left behind for others in the future to to inherit. Um, so it it meant a great deal for me to have someone that was um, wiser <laughs> in some ways, mm -hmm. and and that he needed to 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 have that to be a representation of that possibility. Um, but, in, but in some ways, I, I, I guess I could make the argument or, or there may be some critics or, or, or writers that would assume that, well, Moribibi and, or, or potentially Camila are, is probably the wisest of, of, of the entire group of, of, of characters, which I, li I like that, that possibility, mm -hmm. even though she's the youngest, mm -hmm. right? That she is the youngest character um mm -hmm. she knows what needs to be done which is essentially um why well, I, I won't i won't spoil it but um it takes it takes a great effort to to sort of rid rid themselves of of those histories and she's the one who enacts that agency um by the end of the novel um the one who is most subject to to kind of these criticisms and and a target for a lot of the a lot of the the evils that occur she's the one who enacts that agency mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is mm. which i think is an important movement that the novel tries to gesture at mm. i kind of want to follow up on that line of you know the role of poetry in the novel and writing um it it's connected to the idea of memory and memory is so central it's in the name of the this yeah. new society yeah. they've established um urayuan is obsessed with history, not forgetting him. He wants his name everywhere. He wants to be remembered. Then you have Cheo writing down through poetry, um, trying, you know, as a witness to everything that's happened. You have uh, Camila, you know, holding on to the memory of her sister, you know? So, so, so memory seems to be so... Then Damaris too, Damaris and her sketches, right? Of the people of their in memoria. So there's from different angles, you're seeing how memory um, becomes such a central part um, of the novel. So there's that push to like remember the past, but then there's also this force, this gesture towards the future and what the future has to bring. So there's that tension between future and the past, right? Um, I don't know. I just wonder if you can speak a little more about the role of memory, you know, how you envisioned it. Um, I mean, it's, it's probably, you know, uh, we probably need a whole hour for you to answer that question, but whatever you can tell us, right? Ado, Ado Caguana, you know, Urayon's name, you know, right. he's being referenced as a yeah. conceit. So the memory, there, I think memory there is historical too. Yeah. Yeah, I... I think it's it's a complicated a complicated question, and I and I'm I'm happy to to sort of have it in room for discussion about what what we can perceive to it to be memory. I don't when I think about the memory of of that storm, or when I think about um, the the amount of of, of investment that occurs um, to to either remember or forget. Um, it becomes apparent in kind of how these characters imagine the political structures, right? So there's this there's this line that I think that happens in the novel where where uh, Moribibi is the one who says it actually, 
um, where she's exhausted by these these sort of sustained promises or these these proposed ideas, and that that part of the the I guess the legacy of, of, of colonialism, because that's that's what's most apparent, is to to eradicate memory, right? Is to is to mm. uh, move mm. away from from origin and to establish a dominant uh, uh, culture or, or language or whatever it may be that essentially will 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 benefit the one that's trying to impose that. And so I think that um, that's what makes Urayan so interesting in that in, is that he's very much aware of this, but he's 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 a megalomaniac, right? So in many yeah. ways, his his, his greatest mm-hmm. concern is is how he's remembered, rather how rather than how the island will be remembered or how those that he he could help or not help um, mm-hmm. will remember um, these events. Um, so I think I think that that the gestures towards memory are are mostly concerned with or thinking of a lot about um, what what do we choose to remember um, what do we choose to 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 keep with us and 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 how maybe how cynical you might have to be when thinking about um, conversations about language and identity right that, that, that Puerto Rico's identity is, is still very much um, in regards to language um, ascribed to, to Spanish, which is, as we all know, it's a colonial language. And so we, we kind of have to challenge these, these ideas of, of, of what we hold dear and, and, and think about them in interesting ways, but also withholding the things that, that keep us and that, and that sustain us. And I, and I don't, I, I, like, I, like, like you said, Marisa, I think that, that the, novel, the novel treats memory as a complication, but that these characters are most interested in trying to be record keepers of these events. Mm-hmm. So the simple, I guess the simple response is that um, these, these characters are record keepers and witnesses mm-hmm. of, of what, what has occurred. And they're, they're trying to leave behind something that, that demonstrates that memory of, of, of their histories, their cultural histories, um, the, the island's histories, um, but that it's not necessarily nostalgic. If anything, I think the nostalgia may be drawn towards like this desire for nature. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Like, like mm-hmm. there, there's a there's a nostalgia for wanting to see the beauty of of, of Puerto Rico in 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 display um, mm-hmm. beyond mm-hmm. culture, beyond beyond people. It's it's this desire for 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 nature to yeah. to be reimposed, um, which which mm-hmm. might be a commentary on sort of the climate crisis or climate change, possibly, maybe um, that's mm-hmm. a debate. Yes, for sure. Yeah. I, I think we're being asked, and I think it's a good idea to, to move on to the, to the Q&A, <laughs> but I just want to say that in my head, I was thinking, who is the Velorio for, or what is the Velorio for? And I think you just answered it in part, you know, um, in part, you know, that it's on that scale. It's on the scale even of like planetary destruction. Mm-hmm. Um, I only just thought of it now as you were speaking, you know, <laughs> unless you have another answer to that or a pat answer to that. I think the Velorio is so multidimensional. Yeah, um, yes. And, and, of, I, course, and you... of course, the painting, the most famous painting perhaps in Puerto Rican art history. So it's such a potent title, you know. Yeah, and, um, and I think, um, well, I, I guess to be very brief, because we do want to leave time for the Q&A. Um, yes. The, the way that that yeah. title came about was uh, there was a very long list of really bad titles <laughs> before mm-hmm. that title. <laughs> um, and, the, and I'm usually, I like to think I'm usually okay with titles. And, but for the longest time, it was a very difficult negotiation of what was going to happen with the book because mm-hmm. after it, when we were about to go on submission for, for the book to see if it would be acquired, uh, it still didn't have a title. Because the title that it has and had in place was like taken from a poem, like "Lantern of a Caravel" from one of Walcott's uh, poems, and and my agent mm. hated it. But she she's no, she's mm. more genu- uh, generous than that. She was just like, I don't know, let's challenge this a little bit. And I mm-hmm. I, I had this long list of bad titles, and I sent them to her, and she was like, None of these are working. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I was having a conversation with my with my spouse about about. What 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 is going to happen? What do we call this? And then we started talking about <laughs> painting, and and mm-hmm. I remember a visit. I remember a visit that I had with my tattoo artist, who's a 
he has to be a, a, a brilliant artist, right? Um, because he just, he's an autodidact about art and art history. And so he was just telling me one, mm -hmm. when he's inflicting pain on me, he's telling me this, the, the mm -hmm. history because he, he would travel a lot. And he was telling me the history of Francisco Yale that he was reading about um, mm -hmm. in one of the books published, uh, I think from Paris to San Juan or something published by Yale. Um, mm. and, and he was referring to, 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 to Francisco Yale and how he was sort of in circles with um, uh, Pizarro and he was in, in circles with all the people that would essentially become like the Impressionist movement, but that he moved back um, to Puerto Rico to educate and to, to sort of impart art. And, and mm. one of the things that my tattoo artist said, and maybe he took this from someone, so I don't know, this is all the art historians will be better at, at maybe analyzing this or talking about this, was saying that, mm. that, that, that Francisco Yale died with culture and with history, like with, with that and being able to get back to Puerto Rico versus someone like Camilo Pizarro inscribed himself in a different kind of history, but that his, the history of his home wasn't necessarily um, evolved because it, it ascribed to Impressionism, which in itself became like a subset of history, but not like a personal cultural history. So it was a beautiful mm -hmm. thing. And I kept thinking about that. Um, and then of course, mm -hmm. the painting itself was, 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 was pretty apparent. And so I said, well, she suggested it, my, my, my spouse suggested it. And I said, okay, all right, I think let's try that. And everyone loved it. So she gets the mm. credit. That's that simple. Mm. <laughs> That's the short of it. She and gets and your tattoo artist. And your tattoo and artist. Awesome. I, I would say so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that story. So, fantastic. So questions. We have a few here on the queue. Uh, I'll start with the first one. Um, all of your characters had hope with all the setbacks. It was as if their hope was their strength, willpower, and determination. Each character's hope was not the same as the others yet. They were so united. Can you speak of how hope carried each character through their journey? Yeah, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a pessimist. <laughs> which is which anyone who knows me even slightly or really would 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 would, uh, would realize that pretty fast but I think something something that is it's pretty apparent in how the the novel was essentially pitched is this idea of hope and resilience and all these these sort of strong emotions um but I came across uh Marisol Lebron's like take on resilience right that it sort of uh, uh removes accountability of of um mm. of those that could potentially be sort of in, um, committing these these acts of, of 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 either violence or colonial violence and i and i kept thinking mm. that I, I it's fascinating mm. that that hope is entrenched in all this but i i i really thought of this novel as potentially nihilistic even though it's not but that's just me mm. uh thinking of it in, mm. in those terms but i think that that the hope is in in sort of keeping account and bearing witness if there is such a thing um, and how those things are, are difficult to, to, to leave behind, how bearing witness is not, um, is not an easy task. I teach, I often teach, it's very, an older essay by, by Chris Abani, um, so painting the body of loss in the proximity of an aesthetic and he talks about um, bearing witness and he talks about um, the role that artists play and what art could potentially do and in, in many ways, I think that the novel attempts to bear witness, but that the characters carry hope in different ways, as, as was stated in the question. Um, and, and some are more damning than others. Some of the hope is more damning mm -hmm. than others because some of them are, are some of them enacted, like Urayuan enacted in a very violent way, that they consider mm -hmm. hope as, as as basically an alternative to uh, to think to to using hope as a weapon and taking advantage of people to to bring them in in a vulnerable state. So, so thinking about like infomercials, for example, like why why do they play at, at one in the morning because it's like the most vulnerable state that someone could potentially be in, right? And like you're watching TV mindlessly and then you're like, oh, this could be a good idea, even though it's not. So I think that that's it's the same idea for someone like Urayon is thinking about hope, um, but using that weaponizing it. And, and taking advantage of, mm -hmm. but that there is resistance even in hope, um, mm -hmm. and that and that these characters, I get they they do band together and and they combat that um, some tragically. Um, and Banto, of course, we could spend a whole segment on Banto, <laughs> poor Banto, as some would say, but um, that he he retains that hope and he even acts on agency because of that hope. Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm. And he, he stands up for himself finally against Urayuan, mm. which is, I think, a beautiful and sad moment because of what happens, mm. obviously, after. Mm -hmm. um, should I read the second question? Yeah. Um, uh, Donna Bonkuban, Professor Donna Bonkuban. Xavier, first, congratulations for giving me another great text to study and enjoy. Now, could you explain to us a bit more about what you mean when somewhere the text says, unlike nature, that recognizes and accepts change through adaptation to disaster, the leaders of Puerto Rico seem to lack the flexibility to adapt to change. That unlike nature, the leaders have no vision and hence are incapable of offering the type of adaptation necessary for people to rise from all the kinds of disasters that Puerto Ricans have endured over the centuries, political, historical, economic, developmental, et cetera. Hmm. <laughs> oh, I love that question. Thank you, Dana Wang. Of course, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a question worthy of a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, how to sort of break that apart and, and think about it. I, it's, it is a complicated question, but it's an important question because it's trying to discover what what comes next and I think it's trying to to ask or think about how do we how do we envision a Puerto Rico that doesn't that doesn't maybe doesn't ascribe to to statehood but doesn't that that enacts independence but that it doesn't sort of reciprocate colonialism in its own way and one of the things that the characters are very are upset about with Damaris of course and Moribi are upset about is is this idea that that the political structures, as even obviously in American culture, uh, they tend to sort of revolve around similar circles, um, and it's very apparent back home. And and that there's also a certain sort of pedigree or or, des, or or like a design, a larger design that comes into who ends up in office and who ends up like promoting certain laws that at the end of the day benefit a very small portion of the population that's at home. And that, and that mm -hmm. to me is, it's what's always been very frustrating. Um, I obviously growing up seeing it, um, but being angry about it uh, was, was I think the most apparent thing that the novel tries to, to address. I don't think that it offers um, solutions as, as, mm -hmm. as it's worthy of a dissertation. It asks a lot of questions and it brings a lot of questions about how, how then do we do this? How then do we move away mm -hmm. from, from from the same people or the same people adjacent, right? The same people that are adjacent to the people that that, that are that are in politics. Um, but it's it's a fascinating thing because there's a pop, uh, it's a population. We're a population that loves to vote, and we're a population that loves to be involved. And so I think that that the optimism is inherent, and the hope potentially arises in that in that desire that there is a desire to participate. It's just that there are very set and inscribed um, political allegiances that in many ways mm. mirror the obvious things that have occurred in the United States, which is like this ultra politicization of, of what parties mean and not what they're saying, but that are you uh, the Palma or are you the, 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 the red or are you the, the, the green party? And I think those things, those things have just been weaponized. They've been used to sort of feel that you're a part of a team and that and mm -hmm. that to me is what's most i think concerning but that the young the younger generations have been fed up with it it yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's a great question um mm -hmm. i probably didn't answer it but that's okay then i think <laughs> <laughs> there'll be there'll be hopefully many papers and 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 dissertations that will think about it and, and analyze the book in its in its ways <laughs> So I'll take the next question. Wilfredo Santiago Hernandez, can you, what can you discuss about the polyvocality of the novel and the collective healing it displays in contrast to the yet to be had healing for Puerto Ricans post Maria? It was very important to me that the novel wasn't going to be about any one character. Um, and as, mm -hmm. as I guess we alluded to at the beginning of the conversation that there is a resistance for sort of polyvocal narratives and it's kind of apparent in some just general feedbacks that, that the book has received, like this idea of being mm -hmm. lost. And it's like, I keep thinking about like, well, if they're lost with just six characters, how do people get through like the history of seven killings or something like that? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> it's a, or or like dying. 
which is essentially <laughs> one of the one of the books that I had near me, right? Thinking about as I lay down, thinking about how mm-hmm. voices or structure or form are implemented in the book. Mm-hmm. But it was it was it was a necessity to think about um, this as a collective process for these characters, mm-hmm. that they were going to feed each other's narratives, um, but that it feels like a chorus. But it's not. I don't. You know, there's there are a lot of books now that are trying to attempt polyvocalness and that they they're being pitched or sold as like choruses and, and things of that nature which is which is curious to me of course um because i think it's just a a term that's used just to throw out there so i i would say that there is a soft chorus it's not a larger chorus but it's a chorus of it, it's a it's a community of of different perspectives mm-hmm. of, of characters that have all experienced different things but that they're one of the underlying things that they obviously carry is the storm they carry the the history of of the uh, the islands. They carry the history of of, of languages, um, and that these representations are essentially going to come forward in a process of of as as I said earlier, like a bearing witness attempt, but in more so of, of of community of of the only way that people essentially survived the storm is through community, right? <laughs> that 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 it was neighbors, that it, was, it wasn't the government, it wasn't anyone that came and, and saved anyone, it was each other. So we saved each other um, and we banded together and we, we, we ousted a governor. And that's, that's a beautiful moment um, that we should, we should attribute and continue to apply when we think about trying to reimagine our islands. Uh, is that we have kind of established a blueprint of what, what a what a what a population un pueblo can do to 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 a government in a positive way, but it wasn't an easy thing, right? It, it took Ricky Martin and Bad Bunny and and very very public faces to 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 push this in such a way that 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 there was no other option, it, even if it was a gesture, right? If it was a gesture to just remove one person two summers after the storm, it was a, a vital gesture, and and my hope along with the book's hope is, is, is to think about alternatives. Um, and that's only co- accomplished through community. And I think that's what the book, book thinks about, right? It thinks about community um, mm-hmm. through its, its, mm-hmm. its, its polyvocal um, expressions. Mm-hmm. That's a great answer. Yeah. Connor Tomas Reed's question. Post Maria Puerto Rico has its fair share of villains. The colonial government, cryptocurrency gurus, Airbnb parasites. In opposition, a wave of insurgencies is rising for women and trans people, teachers' pensions, mutual aid against colonial debt, and more. I gently wonder whether the depiction of a band of reds led by megalomaniac Urayawan could confuse for readers the political conditions of how the island has developed transformative power, in part via anti-colonial, anti-capitalist strategies even against some of its own parasitic leaders. Is your depiction of the Reds and their leader a general critique of unthinking movements? Could it be possibly misread as a critique of current post huracan movements on the island? That's a good I, I question. Can't, I can't say, I'll add UPR strike to that one. <laughs> Go ahead. You know, you know it's a, that's another, I think, up important observation when we're thinking about uh, representations of, of of resistance. Um, you know, I don't I don't necessarily have a, a clean answer for that. I think that um, I think that one of the things that that has always been been part of when I think about about home is a, a sort of a conflict of, of um, a conflict of of my my own histories, right? Uh, the education system, for example, has always been really close to me. My mom's a teacher, my spouse is a teacher. Um, I'm very, very much familiar with, with the lack of, of support that the education system has on the island. And I think the reason why I'm leaning on that as, as a possible conversation, because I'm thinking about um, the desire to eradicate accessibility to education. Um, and what that does, like in larger implications of, of, of the population, right? That there are there are so many Puerto Ricans back home that are not in school because they don't have schools to attend to, because schools are closing left and right in rural communities and all that other and all those other things. And so who is left with accessibility of education? Those who have the privilege to send their kids to to potentially more prominent 
schools on the island. So I think that that when we think about the Reds or when we think about um, what they may represent, I think there are, there are many possibilities to, for that. But one of the things are the vulnerability that a population might have um, when, when there is a lack of accessibility for education, which is why La Yupi is one of the most and maybe the last and lasting important symbols and, and important institutions on the island that needs to remain where it's at, which is, a, again, mm -hmm. thinking about beauty, that is the most, it, it is so essential um, that, it, mm -hmm. that it tries to, to, to stay a, a, as a public institution. Um, because it's trying to uh, attempt the bridge in spite of the fact that, that the government or those are trying to tear that bridge um, away from it, um, from its population. So it, to me, to me it's, a, it's a complicated thing, like what these things represent, but I, I leave it up to the critics. I think they, people will analyze or think about this book in, in many different ways. Mm -hmm. But I think that the most fun thing about the book is that there is no clear answer to anything. So yeah. it'll, be, it'll be a beautiful thing or not, I mean, who knows, <laughs> uh, to see uh, perspectives debated and perspectives mm -hmm. about representation or what these things may mean or not mean on, that the book reveals. Um, because that's the colonial condition is a complicated conversation, and anything treat anything treating sort of uh, neo colonial states as kind of like this this is the answer, I think is a very um, misinformed um, uh, tonic for for the problem. It doesn't it doesn't address the the I, and I think this was said in one of your classes, where it's one of my first classes in IUP in the Caribbean. Um, and, and Caribbean narratives that you taught, which is that you know, sort of the political schizophrenia that happens on the islands. It's, so these ideas of, of the multitudes of, of identities and language and all of the above of histories um, isn't simple and, and it shouldn't be. And therefore it requires a, a crazy book like this one that, that presents so many obstacles for interpretation that, that it, it's a feast of, of, of possibilities. Um, but I don't have power for who interprets or how they interpret things. That is that is up to mm -hmm. to to those who teach or write about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, so we we want to be mindful of everyone's time, and we're getting signals right that we need to wrap it up uh, at this point. And it it's really sad it because was... there were several other questions that were really good that I was hoping to to get to ask you, but hopefully there will be more events like this and you can continue answering some of your readers' questions. Yeah, and I think it's an They're important thing to emphasize that mm -hmm. you, everyone needs to buy Puerto Rican literature. Like being, being yes. a part of a, 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 a sort of a, an institution, sort of like larger publishing that, that is very unaware of, 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 of literature, they go by numbers. So buy the book, teach the book if you want to yeah. and move forward in supporting it because you can't complain about representation if you're not reading and, 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 and teaching or talking about the books that we produce. Yeah. That's sort of the capitalism of, of it all. <laughs> but I'm, I'll pitch in before we close. Yeah, question. Loretta, had, yeah. Loretta had two questions in the chat if you just want to look at them on your own, um, Xavier. Um, I don't know if you want to look yeah. at any of the questions that were left on your own. Um, uh, so that they don't get lost. I think on behalf of everyone, I, I want to say congratulations again. Felicidades, Xavier, for, for this outstanding novel. And thank you for giving us this gift. We're going to be thinking about it and writing about it for a long time, I'm sure, um, and teaching it. So thank you. Thank you all for, for this wonderful conversation. Congratulations. Congratulations thank you, and thanks, everybody, thank you, everyone. for asking questions. Bye. Thank you everyone for coming. Javier, Maricel, Maritza, we were so excited to have you here today for this beautiful conversation. I'm gonna run out to get the book after work. This has been enlightening and I hope you didn't spoil too much with this conversation for me and the others who have not read it. Um, we invite everyone to join us again on Thursday for another event at Centro, a town hall on inclusive language beginning at 4.30 p.m. if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we would like to thank all of the attendees for coming and asking such fantastic questions to our panelists. If you have any questions or concerns, you can, of course, always email Centro, and we hope to see you at future events. Have a great afternoon, everyone. <laughs>